Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. I'm sure it was tempting to stay in that warm bed or in front of that warm fire this morning. <laughs> but I think you'll be glad you came. So we extend a special welcome to any of you who are visiting with us today. And we welcome those who are joining us online. And for all of you, I hope this service is a blessing to you. Please sign the red attendance pads that you'll find in your pew. The beautiful plant gracing our chancel this morning is dedicated to the glory of God and given by the Grace Congregation in loving memory of Larry Edge. We will have Lenten prayer partners again this year. If you would like to be and receive a Lenten prayer partner during the six weeks of Lent, Valerie has the forms for you this morning. If you will please raise your hand and she will bring you one of the forms to fill out. It gives some information about you to give to your secret prayer partner. Last week I said that you pray for each other. That's not right. <laughs> you pray for one person and then some other person is praying for you. And then those little gifts you bring, little tokens and notes and things you give to a person and then someone else is giving to you. And then on Easter you find out who has been your secret prayer partner. There will be an adult Lenten combined Sunday school class held in the fellowship hall beginning February 18th at 9.30 a.m. The class will be led by Phil McCollum and Linda McKenzie. We invite everyone to attend this special six-week study on the Apostles' Creed by Adam Hamilton. The kids and youth will have an activity tonight at 5.15. So Valentine's Day February 14th, there will be a Valentine's dinner, and this is going to be hosted by the Grace Youth. So bring your Valentine with you, or if you don't have a Valentine, that's fine too. Just come. The, uh, the lasagna salad, garlic bread and cake, a really good dinner. It'll cost you $7 per person, or if you have a family of three or more, it'll be $20. And you don't have to make a reservation, just come. Then following that Valentine's dinner will be the Ash Wednesday service. The dinner is at 5.30 on February 14th, and the Ash Wednesday service is at 7. Now, one more thing. We're so delighted that Lori, is, um, Lori Ellenberg is expecting a baby. So we want to shower her with good wishes and... Diapers and wipes. <laughs> There's a notice in your bulletin that lets you know it'll be February 18th, the Sunday after Valentine's Day, and it'll be a drop-in from 2 to 3.30 in the Grace Fellowship Hall. Any other announcements? Thank you. Would you stand for our call to worship? Lord, you have called us. Make us worthy of our call. That we may rejoice in your love and saving power. And proclaim your presence and glory to the world around us. Our opening hymn is 89, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
faith that is the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your hymnal number 881. Let us join together in the historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. and we invite our children to come forward for the children's time. How are you all? Good. Have you ever had a teacher or a parent say to you, are you listening to me? Yes? Oh, yes. Okay. Your parents say yes. Okay. Or maybe when they're just a little bit upset, maybe they say, what did I just tell you? But if they really want to listen, Emmy, what's your full name? Hmm? Karen? Caroline. Caroline. They would say, Emmy Caroline Sowell. Are you listening to me? And then you know they really mean it, right? Yes. Have any of those things happened to any one of you? Yes, okay, we got one honest one up here. Okay, way to go, two honest ones. Well, I ask you those questions because sometimes, just sometimes, maybe we don't listen. But maybe, though we might hear what the other person is saying, we don't always act on what the people are telling us. And guess what? Adults do the same thing all the time. Which is why in today's story, Jesus is telling the people the good news that he's reading in scripture. Now if you remember, two weeks ago Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River and then last week, he was tempted by Satan in the desert. Do you remember that? Well, this week, Jesus goes to his hometown where he grew up as a little child and worked in the carpentry shop with his dad. Does anybody know where that was? Close. It wasn't Bethlehem, but that's all right. It was Nazareth, Nazareth. And so he is coming to his hometown, and he's all grown up now. And 
they, he comes to the synagogue. Now the synagogue is like a church for the Jewish people. And he comes there on their Sabbath. Just like we come to church on Sunday, they go to church or synagogue on Saturday. So he always came to church, Jesus did. And all of the Gospels, they talk about him coming to church. And they were so excited, and they let him read the Bible that day. Now, the Bible isn't like our book of the Bible. They have a scroll, and they roll the scroll up, and then when they're getting ready to read it, they roll it out till they get to the place, and they read it, and then they roll it back up. Now, Jesus talked about the good news, and he said the good news actually happened that day. And people were like, he said that he was the Messiah. He was God's own son. And that he had fulfilled the scripture that very day. Well, it would be like you, E.J., coming back when you grew up and saying in the pulpit, because we would be so excited that you came back to church in Pickens, and we gave you the Bible, and you said, guess what? I am the Messiah, the Son of God. And we'd go, say what? <laughs> we thought that that was Jennifer and that you're their kid. <laughs> say what's going on? And so the people were just so confused. Some of them got so mad that they took them up to a mountain and were going to throw them off the mountain. Yeah. Yes. But he disappeared in their midst. But Jesus was saying to them, you can't just hear God's word. You have to do God's word. So if he says to love other people, you can't just hear it. You've got to go do it. And that's what makes the scripture be fulfilled. So when we are given and we're told the Bible from our parents or from our Sunday school, we really need to listen, but then we have to go do those things to make the Bible alive. So if the Bible says share, what do we need to go do? Share. If the Bible says give to the hungry, what do we need to go do? Give to the hungry. And that makes the Bible come alive. And that's our job. Well, that was the good news that Jesus shared with them that day. And so don't make your parents say all your names to get you to listen. Listen the first time, okay? All right, let's say our prayer. Dear God, thank you for Jesus who encourages us and then shows us how to live scripture just like he did. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming up today. Get a little treat here for yourselves. This is a moment in the service when we take time to pray for joys and concerns. There was not one handed to me this morning, but let me just remind you of the new way that we're doing this. As you enter the sanctuary, the ushers have small slips of paper on which you can write 
a prayer request and sign your name to it, and then the lay reader will read it at this time in the service. But also, take a moment to look on the back of your bulletin. Those in our thoughts and prayers, there are prayer requests there. They're there every week. I urge you to pay special attention to those. Also, you'll see members of our church who we pray for in special ministry, there are health issues, and then military members of our family. So there are important things to pray for. Thank you. I invite you to go to God with me in prayer. Holy God, you call us wanderer of seashores and sidewalks, inviting us to sail out of our own smug harbors into uncharted waters of faith, to wander off from our predictable paths to follow you. Lord Jesus, you are the one and only Christ. You called many people from many walks of life to leave their own ways and follow you, to be your disciples, and to prize people as something to seek, find, and restore. Lord Jesus, you are the one true leader of every church, and we choose to stand as one church, your church, and to lift our focus from our differences and those things that divide us. We will leave our own ways and follow you together, support each other as we seek to be your disciples and work together to focus on fishing for people once more. For we must act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly together before you and each other. For the sake of our worship of you and our love for each other and the future and freedom all those still living in poverty, Lord Jesus, we ask for your Spirit's help with this, for we are quick to focus on ourselves, our labels, and our differences, rather than the same nets in our own hands and the same leader before us. Christ, have mercy in your precious name, which unites us all. We pray today for those who are ill and for those who are weary in spirit. Heal us all, Lord Jesus. We ask in your powerful name as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Oh! 
And now I invite the ushers to come forward for sharing our morning tithes and offerings. standing, we will be singing verses 1, 3, and 5 of I Surrender All, number 354.
please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. I'm reading from Luke 4, verses 14 through 21. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Please be seated. I have a question to ask you today. A serious question at that. Do you need the church? Think about it. What would your life be like without the church? Imagine what it would be like to have never met the friends that you have made here, never worshiped together, never sang Christmas carols together, never volunteered or sent your child to vacation Bible school, never heard a cantata, never ate lunch together at a fellowship supper. If there were no church, who would be there for you when you lost a loved one? Who would baptize your children or your grandchildren? Who would you call when you most needed someone to pray for a loved one? Do you need the church? A growing number of people don't think so. Did you know that? The largest growing population isn't another religion. It's people who don't believe in God. Or if they do believe, they don't believe in organized religion anymore. They declare their independence before God and the congregation. For some who are Christians, they just won't commit to getting up on a Sunday morning. Yet when we join the church, we vow to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. So I ask you again, do you need the church? You see, it takes humility to need each other. Perhaps that's why I love this church so much. We are willing to be vulnerable to one another, to let each other see our weaknesses, knowing that we will be loved even more because we do. And though I am your pastor, there are times that you have pastored me. So I ask in all sincerity, do you need the church to which I say a resounding yes, I do, and other people do too. And it's up to us to invite them in. Who can do that? Well, what are the letters in the middle of the word church? You are. The call of Jesus, in my opinion, gives us the mission of the church. In this passage from Luke, Jesus has just triumphed 
over the temptation of Satan during his 40 days in the wilderness. Luke chooses his passage to begin telling about Jesus' public ministry. What Jesus said on this occasion defines him as the Messiah and perfectly defines his ministry. What he said that day in the synagogue of Nazareth when he began his Galilean ministry is a perfect summary of Jesus' mission. Luke began in verse 14 saying, And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and the news of him spread throughout all the surrounding districts, and he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. Now, however, Jesus has come home, back to his hometown of Nazareth. Luke says, as was Jesus' custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath. I love that. Jesus went to church. Well, he went to synagogue. And whenever you see Jesus in the Gospels, whether it's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, it was always finding Jesus on his Sabbath in the synagogue. He was always there. When it came to the day of worship, Jesus was always faithful. Perhaps you could say that Jesus knew that he needed the church. So here he is back in his hometown in Nazareth. He'd been going to that same synagogue since he was a little boy. And you can surely almost hear people clamoring, Hey, did you hear that Jesus... The one that John said was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Did you hear that Jesus, you know, the one who changed water into wine at our neighborhood Cana? Or did you hear that Jesus who was healing people in Judea? Did you hear that this Jesus who we grew up with, Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary, who worked in the carpenter shop, did you hear that Jesus is back? And that he's going to the synagogue this Saturday. And for certain, this is the time that they're going to give him the scroll and let him preach. Why, it would almost be like an inaugural address. Itself a speech which informed people of your intention as a leader. The opening marks are significant. For this is the first formal address as a leader now in power as to his priorities, his actions, his aim. In Luke 4, in Jesus' first public address, Jesus explained who he is and what he came to do. So though Jesus had preached before, this is the first recorded sermon that we have. On this occasion, for the first time in Nazareth, he stood up to read. And he read from the prophet Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to proclaim release to the captives and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And after he read it, he rolled back the scroll and sat down because being seated was the traditional posture for preaching. And Luke says, and all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. Can't you see them? People crammed and jammed in there to hear their hometown boy made preacher just imagine that kind of scene. What was he going to say? And he began and said, Today the scripture, this scripture, has been fulfilled in your hearing. Whoa. Stop. Rewind the tape, please. Maybe we heard that wrong. Nobody had ever said that before. Not even a preacher had said that before. They would say, someday this scripture will be fulfilled, but not today. 
This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He said it. Because you don't know what it means to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. It means that the Messiah has arrived. And Jesus had just said, everything you've been waiting for is here. Everything you've been hoping for stands before you. Today, right here, right now, the scripture has been fulfilled. And the people were probably downright shocked to the core. Some of them, like I said in the children's sermon, were so angry that if we continued in this passage, they took him up to a high mountain and were trying to throw him off. But he escaped right in the midst of them. But Jesus continued. Jesus' mission was fivefold. To bring good news to the poor, to set the prisoner free, to give sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And if these are Jesus' objections, objectives, then we need to apply that to what we do in the church. So let's take a look at them. To bring good news to the poor. It has always been the biblical witness to care for the economically poor. As Christians, we have been called to care for those less fortunate than us. No, not called, commanded. And we will be judged on how we care for them. Make no mistake. But having known incredibly wealthy people, I can also say that there are other forms of poverty. There is a spiritual poverty that cannot be healed by finances. Have you ever considered Luke 6.20 in the Beatitudes reads, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. But in Matthew 5.3, it reads, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Two very different interpretations. So I ask you, what is your condition of poverty today? Are you poor in spirit? Then know this. Whatever you are going through, God is capable. If you stand and you say that you need the church, let me say loud and clear that you and I and the church need Jesus. Jesus calls us to proclaim release to the captives. Though it's still almost impossible for me to believe there are still people in the world imprisoned or persecuted for their ideas and their beliefs. There are people in the world who cannot believe that we have the privilege and freedom to come and worship as we choose, and we don't make it a priority in our lives to come and do so. We simply do not act as if we need the church. Maybe we should say, we need the church when it is convenient. We need the church when something goes wrong. Maybe we should say we need the church, but not enough to be faithful to it. We are captive to the many distractions that call us from faithfulness. So much of the time we do not turn our eyes upon Jesus. There are so many things that hold us captive in life our possessions, our fears, our worries, our addictions. What is your condition today? Are you enslaved by habits, by thoughts you cannot control, by circumstances that overpower your will? This morning, the world needs us to proclaim release to all that holds us and others captive. Jesus calls us to give sight to the blind and liberty to the oppressed. Now we know that through his miraculous power, Jesus gave sight to the physically blind. But there are those who are spiritually blind. 
Have you ever had the experience of walking into a movie theater, just coming out from the sun, and you're trying to find your seat and it is completely dark, and you are just groping around trying to get to a chair? And then when you've been in there for a while, your eyes kind of adjust, and you can see where you're going down the aisle. When the movie's over, you return to the brilliant sunlight, and the light actually causes you to wince and your eyes to water as you quickly put on your sunglasses. After having spent time in the darkness, the light actually hurts your eyes. I wonder if our eyes have become adjusted to seeing in the spiritual darkness of our world. Our world lives in spiritual darkness, but we have adjusted our eyesight and, generally speaking, have become used to the twilight zone. We may not be able to see God or others or ourselves clearly, but we see well enough to get along in life. People today living in the midst of darkness are not attracted to more darkness, they're attracted to the light. So Christians have got to make sure that Jesus' light is shining in our lives. He is there. He is the light of the world. Let's not adjust our eyesight to darkness anymore. Let's come in to the light. Jesus calls us to, ex to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. But let us never forget that our mission is able to proclaim that salvation has arrived, that Jesus the Messiah has come. That's why the world needs the church. That's why I need the church to be reminded every day and every Sabbath that Jesus lives and that Jesus loves and that Jesus will come again. Do you need the church? I hope your answer is a resounding yes. So let me ask and let you answer. Do you need the church? Yes. Well, I want to remind you today that the church also needs you. We can't be about the mission without you. I guarantee that God sent you here on earth for a purpose and that that purpose can be better fulfilled by your identification with the church and the church can fulfill its mission only with you. We just have to remember that the church and each of us needs Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Father, it is so refreshing to attend a synagogue in Nazareth with Jesus today, to be taken back to see the wonder of his person in another time. He is so amazing to us, so glorious. We thank you that you have caused us to know him and love him that he is not a stranger to us, but that this Jesus who stepped into his own town, his own synagogue, this Jesus who announced that he brought the age of salvation, this Jesus who preached the good news that we belong to him, he lives in us, he loves us, he gave his life for us, and someday he will take us to glory to be with him forever. Father, increase our love for him, and may the wonder of his person continually translate into increasing devotion in our lives, for we indeed need thee every hour. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn we will sing the first and the fourth verse of I Need Thee Every Hour. Let us stand.
If you would take your hymnals and turn to page 38. I want to introduce you to Betsy Sparks. She was born and bred in Ohio, but we won't, you know, for Michigan, I won't hold that against her. (laughs) (laughs) And is a member of Bryce United Methodist Church. She moved to Pickens in March of 2021 when she married a Pickens man, Harold Hal, but she calls him Sparky. She is greatly talented artistically and hand makes the most beautiful cards, which she donated some to the United Methodist Women's Bazaar. She has joined the United Methodist Women. She sings in the choir and says she feels very much at home here at Grace United Methodist Church. And we are so excited that she is coming to join our church today. So... We have only two questions for you, Betsy. As a member of Christ's Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? I will. And as a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? Members of the household of God, I commend Betsy to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase her faith, confirm her hope, and perfect her in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ, And in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. I am going to ask Betsy to stand with me so that you can greet her yourself. Betsy, welcome. Receive the benediction. God says, do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And also, go in peace. Amen. <laughs>